Hey everyone, you might be coming to this video from another video that I posted about how excited I am in Cursor, or you're just clicking on this video and I really appreciate you watching it. But basically, I have never been this excited about a tool for a go-to-market use case since I found Clay five years ago. And I really mean that. It's I'm using Cursor for everything right now. And so I really think Cursor is something that more marketers should be getting into. This combination of whatever you launch your campaigns on and then using Clay as the data integration layer and then building a lot of top of funnel things and building lists in, in Cursor and then pushing things through or then just using Cursor to launch campaigns or analyze your data. So many great use cases. So I have another video on the use cases that we're using it for. And so you can check out that video. This is just my learnings in the first two weeks of using Cursor. And really, this is a video meant for me to send to my team. So what's up, Growth Nginx team? Uh, because I'm going to start paying for all of them to have their own licenses. And I want them to start using Cursor. And these are just some of the things that I found repeatedly helped me have a better output with Cursor or prevented me from having worse outputs with Cursor. And I think it would just be useful to publicly post about this. So the, the first thing is anytime, literally anytime I have ever run into a problem using Cursor, we literally just, I, I mean, I literally just solved it by taking a screenshot of the problem and then giving that screenshot the Cursor directly or uploading that screenshot to ChatGPT and asking to solve the problem there. And mainly, I think getting started, the only issues I had was setting up a GitHub account or something. Um, I haven't included this in any of my videos yet, but some people might say, why are you using Cursor instead of Claude Code or instead of Codex and all these things? One, Cursor has Claude Code and Codex uh, baked into it. And then two, I just found it. I tried Codex, Cursor, and Claude Code the same exact days, and I just found Cursor so much easier to get started in and i was just rapidly building things so fast and if i wanted something that only claude code could do i was just selecting claude code and just getting it all done so anyway anytime you have any kind of issue with anything chatgpt and cursor already know how to solve it just show the screenshot of what you're trying to solve and it'll just fix it and so this i'm kind of sending this to my team because i know that they're going to ask me questions about some kind of problem and i'm not going to know the solution to it i'm not an engineer i'm not technical but ChatGPT and Cursor know how to solve these problems because these problems are not new problems on this frontier that we're trying to do. That's another thing that I'd stress for a way that I'm thinking about Cursor too, is this platform and all these AI coding tools are meant to write enterprise grade software. And if you're watching this because you're a marketer, you're watching this because you're in sales, you're in, on a growth team, our coding problems are not enterprise software coding problems. I promise you, cursor is able to figure it out or pick your cloud code or codex or whatever but it, it can totally solve it and so uh one the one thing is use screenshots to solve any of your issues me so i've been seeing a lot of people extremely excited about mcps and the first time i saw somebody post about an mcp i literally made the decision i'm not going to research this right now there are other priorities in my business i don't care Let's move on to to something else. I'm not going to look this in, look into this. Now, Cursor has a way that you can automatically connect an MCP. And I started playing around with MCPs. I have actually been quite disappointed with MCPs. And I have not really found them to be that great. And mainly, I, I don't know. I, I have found it much more beneficial to use the plan mode, which we'll talk about in a little bit and say, you go find the endpoint on their pu public API uh, endpoint and show me the explicit link that you pulled it from so I can make sure that it's correct. Or I just know where the endpoint documentation is and then I just copy and paste it and then I just put it into the plan mode. I have found that to be far more useful than, uh, than MCPs. I found with MCPs that it just kind of, thinks and thinks and thinks and doesn't actually get anything done. I could be uh, incorrect and I'm totally wrong. Uh, and other people love MCPs, but for what I'm trying to do, which is just setting up these workflows, maybe MCPs is just too complicated. So I have found it far easier to just know the endpoint that I want to get, copy and paste that into plan mode. Or if I don't know exactly what API endpoint I want in plan mode, I'll tell it, hey, you go do the research 
and then tell me which endpoint you're going to use and what documentation page you pulled it from just so that I can correct it. Sometimes I was having issues where it was calling the smart lead API and it was completely using the wrong endpoint. And I don't even know where it got that from. It was just, it was, if the endpoint for smart lead is smart lead dot, like if it's like API dot smart lead dot AI, it was calling dev dot smart lead dot AI. And yeah, it was just weird. So anyway, I just find it way better to just give the direct endpoints up front. Uh, you And then we were talking about plan mode a little bit. I think you should be using plan mode. Every time you try to build something, just make up, use plan mode first up front. It's just one little extra step. Uh, and so plan mode, you'll see when you start using cursor, is a mode where you can just drop in a bunch of context. I usually will just talk to it using Whisperflow or I'll have an idea of something that I want to build and then I'll make a voice memo on my phone and then copy and paste that transcript in. And it basically, it just plans out exactly all of the steps that it's about to achieve. And it does that extremely well. Uh, and it you know starts making a step-by-step -step of what you want it to achieve, what endpoints it's going to use and all those other things. I find it, if you jump straight into agent, it's just not going to do as well, but if you use plan mode first, it works really well and just give it a ton of context. Uh, I have one problem that I found, and maybe it's because I'm not technical, but I really like it to, when it's running the code in front of me, especially, so when it's writing the code, I don't really care about seeing that, but I usually request it to output what it's doing at that time so I know that the code is running. There's been a couple of times where I thought something was running and then it wasn't showing me what was going on in the terminal window or just in the cursor chat. And it was 20 minutes where I thought code was running. And then I said, hey, this seems like it's taking a long time. What's going on? And it would say, oh yeah, there was an error. Uh, so sorry. And so I will usually prompt it to just say, uh, and in the coding world, it's, I think if you say print the current status of what you're doing, that's usually what I'll add into the prompt so that I get the actual output of what's running uh, from cursor and it'll actually explain things to me as I go. Um, because otherwise then it'll have errors and it's just not even gonna tell you what's going on with the errors. And then the other thing is I always ask tests before running everything. So I just use cursor to set up 20 different smart lead campaigns in one shot. And I just wanted to make sure that the settings were correct and, and all of those other things. So. I always will tell it before you run the whole code, you need to make a testing code and you need to make a code that'll do everything. And I just always want to inject those tests so that we don't create a ton of problems downstream. So that's just always ask for tests. And then I always ask for CSV backups as the code runs. I actually just did something. Uh, if you saw my video on the SAS classification thing, we just did something the other day where we were doing that SAS classification and my computer crashed and it for some reason didn't save all of the data i don't know why uh so ever since then i've just been asking every time you create something make a csv file as the backup just so that i could go back and see what work was done or that you can pick up from where you left off as well too and that solved the problem um as well too but other than that i think that's my last tip connecting with superbase um we found that if you have something that you want to run on a cron job, GitHub Actions has 2,000 minutes per month for free on private repos. Oh, completely free for public repos. Oh, interesting. And 2,000 minutes per month for private repos. Okay, cool. So uh, I found it really easy to do a lot of our uh, email analytics cron jobs, just uploading it to GitHub Actions. And then everybody's telling me to check out Railway or Vercel, and I haven't quite gotten there yet because I'm still running a lot of things locally, uh, or I'll be using GitHub Actions. We connect to Superbase a lot. Superbase is just an easy to use database that I highly recommend. Everybody's telling me that one day I'm going to graduate from Superbase because there's other things. You all know who you are who tell me that. I'm still on the Superbase train for right now. Oh, and then I do suggest I have a rule that in my cursor. And if you just ask it, like, how can I add a rule to my account? I just told it I don't want you to delete anything. I think there's nothing that could really go wrong if it were to add a lot of campaigns or if it were to add email accounts and then I delete it myself. But if it were to delete things, that would get kind of annoying. So I basically said like, hey, you can write and you could read things, but globally, just as a use case, don't delete anything. Um, and we still handle deletion on our side or I need to give an explicit confirmation. And it, it listens to that rule pretty well. And so again, this video is made a little bit for my team to have some tips and some pointers of how they should start thinking about using cursor but for everyone watching this video all you know a thousand of you thank you i appreciate you people um the main thing i would say is 
you just got to get into it. And even if it feels like it's taking longer, I will sometimes have one side of my screen working on cursor, trying to do the thing automatically. And then I have another side of my screen doing it manually. And then as cursor is thinking and it's writing code, I'll be doing it manually so that I'm getting it done generally in the same amount of time. But once you have figured out to get it done and the code's written, going back to that action is really easy. And it just, I, I'm literally thinking of a world where we're gonna build an internal growth nginx operating system code base just from working normally and then i can give that access to my team my team can write things and they can give it access to my team the rest of the team etc and i think this is kind of how we go from i i would say hardcore we're a services company I, I think anybody who's running a company like me and says that they're a tech enabled services company i think is just a little bit optimistic but I mean, now we're, we're writing code and we're deploying code and, and it's all being put in the cloud and we, you know, I have a GitHub account now and stuff. And so uh, I, I can't stress enough that I think that everybody should be using Cursor. And if you're on a go-to-market team or a marketing team or a sales team, and you can start building this for yourself, I think you're going to find that it's extremely useful. And these are the, some of the things that I found when I was first getting set up that I would just want everybody to just kind of know about. So anyway, I hope this is useful.